Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So today, actually, nothing is really overly new except that we're going to put two things, we techniques we've been using together to find that with just two calculations, sort of two calculations, we're actually able to find the area under of a curve. So if we have a slope function, a derivative, we find its antiderivative, we find the function values at both endpoints and subtract them, that will actually give us the area under the curve. So we're going to take a look at an, a sort of a simple example that shows it works, and then we'll do a few examples, uh, and then we're good to go. Okay, so it takes you back to finding the antiderivative. Remember, it's a, doing a derivative backwards. If we can get that, we plug in two values to get that function value. The right end point, the left end point. Subtract the left end point from the right end point, and we've got, our, uh, we've got what we need much, in a much easier way than we've been doing. So um, we had our test on Monday. Uh, we're getting into section 5.3 today, uh, and then when we come back on Monday after the holiday, uh, we get into our last section, which is really sort of just announcing that what we're doing is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, so that means it must be important, right? So what we're doing today allows a lot of things to happen. Uh, it also means if it's a fundamental theorem, it's not necessarily obvious but it's, it's kind of cool that it does work. Um, so we'll just kind of, uh, so what's the difference, oh shoot, that's, what's the difference between a Riemann sum and a definite integral? Um, well, we were looking at Riemann sums and the area under the curve, we took a bunch of boxes, rectangles, and, and we got an estimate. When we get to the definite integral, what we're doing today, integrating from two boundary points, we'll actually get the exact area. And again, we, we're going to look at it in two ways. We're going to look at the um, sort of the accumulation. There's another word for it that'll come to mind. But notice anything above the x-axis is positive area. Anything below the x-axis is considered negative area. Um, we're going to do that. And then also, since sometimes that derivative function is a velocity, a speed, that would give us sort of where we, you know, the, the net results. So we might go backwards, uh, so we would lose some distance. So this also helps us find distance, but, well, uh, not distance, uh, I'll come up with the word later. But total distance, even if you're going backwards in a negative direction, that's still, you go a mile this way, a mile this way, that's still two miles, right? Uh, the integral would say you went this way and then you came back, so it would subtract and say you, you're back where you started. However, we can also use that integral in a way to find the, the total distance. So that has a little bit of a switch to it. We'll do that example at the end. So I guess a little bit of new stuff. So first we're going to look at calculating the area under the curve, not with today's techniques, but with what we've used before, which was finding the area under the curve. So thinking of this function here that we're given as being a derivative of something, the area under the curve would be the accumulation. And so we could graph this, uh, and we see we end up with a triangle because this is a linear equation. Uh, going from negative three to negative 0.5, negative one half, that was just kind of a convenient place to go. We have this nice little triangle in the area under the curve. We can get it just by simply using the area formula for a triangle, that area, equals one half the base times the height. The base goes from negative three to negative 0.5. Um, so we could look at that as negative three minus negative 0.5, which means that the base is 2.5. And we could look at that as an absolute value, right, a distance. Uh, so the base is 2.5. The height of the triangle goes from y equals 0 to y equals 5, so the height is going to be 5. 
and then we have our one half because that's really the formula for a rectangle, but we've got a triangle which is half of a rectangle. Okay, and so we go ahead and calculate all this out, and what do we get? Six point two five. Is that about right? Check me on it because if I'm wrong, we're we're messed up. No. I did it earlier, so I, I memorized it. I didn't just calculate it, but anyway, okay. So what I want to do now is I want to show you the new technique and show you that that new technique will get exactly the same value. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to use it for shapes that are not easy to find the area underneath. Uh, using the same technique, if you're, you know, if you're not a, if you're a non-believer, there is a theorem and there's pages of showing that this proofs, if that's what you want, this is my proof, it works. <laughs> so then let's just use it and we'll see that it also works, okay? We're also going to use our graphing calculators, the TI-84 will, has a nice little feature to check us on it and it will show us, yes, this is the area underneath the curve, so if you trust your calculator, there you go. You'll have that too. Okay, so uh, again, it popped out too quick. So the technique we're going to use is we're going to find the antiderivative. And so if we have a, a straight line, remember the antiderivative is going to be a, a quadratic because x to the first power, you integrate it, you get its antiderivative. It had to be x squared. So let's do that part first. Um, notice we don't really need this parentheses, but what's the antiderivative of negative 2x? What's that? Negative x, squared. Negative x squared, good. So we, we add one to the exponent, divide by two. So two divided by two is negative one. So we're gonna get negative x squared. See how that, so that, that process of getting an antiderivative with uh, polynomials is pretty straightforward. Add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, and we've got it. Same thing here, and again, we think of this as being one, negative one x to the zero power. So when we add one to it, we get x to the first power, and one divided by one is still one, or negative one. So that's what we get there. Uh, again, we would get plus a constant, right? Because there's also like a plus zero out here, so that could have been a constant if we were to integrate it. The cool part about this technique is we don't need that constant. Uh, we're going to see later on if we do it as an indefinite, we don't put these boundaries on here, we do need that constant or that we would put plus a c. But with these boundaries, a cool thing happens and the technique just says, well, we don't care about what that constant is, we're just going to integrate it. We're going to take this function, which remember this would be the uh, capital F of X, which, because if we take its derivative, we get back to what we started with, right? So you could, you could check over here, test it. If I take this derivative, do I get the stuff inside it? And you would, okay? Just go back and forth. But what we do is we, we integrate, once we integrate, we use the boundaries, and we kind of just write it this way. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take the function at the upper boundary, minus 0.5. So we're gonna get that function value. And then we're going to subtract the function value at negative three. So if I got this right, I didn't practice this, so I hopefully it's, it works out. Actually, I did it once, but sometimes I mix it up with the, the negatives. But uh, so if we subtract these two. So what's f of negative 0.5? Well, we could plug in negative 0.5 for each of these, um, but what we're going to see is uh, I've gra I have the function graphed here. You don't necessarily see it, but uh, I'll show it to you later. But this red function is big F of X, capital F of X, and I can get the function. I, I've got our function values here, um, 0.25. And then I'm going to subtract the function value, remember, um, big F of X at negative 3. And what is that? Negative 6, right? I'm just taking that, that Y value from plugging that in. 
And again, you could get it from manually plugging in negative three, carrying out the calculation, or just use your calculator to look at the table, or come in and get the graph. So this is negative six. So 0.25 minus negative six means a plus, means we end up with 6.25. What did we have when it was a triangle? 6.25, it all works out. So as much as I try to mess things up, sometimes it's just this a simple thing, okay? Isn't that a nice thing if we, all we have to do is find the antiderivative, we plug in the two endpoints, and it's like magic. And I'll tell you, for years I just thought it was magic because I, I couldn't follow the proofs. Even though as a math major, I'm supposed to follow the proofs, but I, I'm never, I'm not a proof guy. So <laughs> I'm a, let's see how it works. It works. Okay, I'll keep using it. Okay. Um, make sense? Okay. So notice what we get is we, it's, it's not as intuitive as when we had the function and we got the derivative, because we could, we could see the graph and we could see sort of the function, the derivative graph, because we could see the, you know, sort of draw tangent lines and see, yeah, it's increasing, so it's gonna be positive and it's decreasing, so that part will be negative. At the top, it would be zero. So going from a function to its derivative was somewhat intuitive. This is what I would call anti-intuitive. It doesn't really, I look at this, I go, how does those things go together? I don't know, but they do. Okay, it's kind of like, so when I've got the derivative and I go back the other way, it does give me the, the original function it came from from those endpoints actually does give me the area under the curve of the derivative. And remember that derivative is a, is a rate, so what it, it represents is an accumulation of stuff. It's like I've got a hose running, it's, it's keeping track of, if I know the speed the water's coming out, it would tell me how much water I've collected, okay? And again, area under the curve might be that's, that's some of it leaking out, so sometimes I want What's the total, but what's going in, what's, I got a leaky boat, sometimes I'm getting water out, sometimes water's coming in. Uh, so we can use it to get net result, thinking of it as negative, or as we're gonna see a little bit later, we can take areas, and when it's under the curve, we look at it as absolute value, so we look at total in and out, you know. So there's two ways we use the, the derivative. This is the standard way for most of what we're going to be doing. Okay, and this is just the graph overall to show you that, yeah, I did graph the derivative function, I graphed the capital F of X, uh, the red function, and I put the boundaries in, and that's where I got the points. Uh, but again, it's not, as, it's, it's not as enlightening, it's not like a switch put on the lights, and, oh, now I understand, but it does work, okay? Somehow, when I get the endpoints of the original function and subtract them, it's kind of getting a distance sort of traveled. It does give me the area under the curve of the derivative. Okay, so there is this connection between these two types of functions, which again, as you work more and more of these, you sort of start, well, that's kind of cool. This math sort of starts making sense about this place or that, that maybe doesn't make sense, but it makes that, well, maybe math really is something that exists, and that's kind of why I like it. It does, it gives us results we can use. You know, poetry's great, we have fun with it. Music's great, I love music, but it's kind of like, you know, can't build a building with music. Or maybe you can't, you know. I guess you can tear it down if you have the right sounds, right, or break glass or something, but uh, with math, we can, it actually works. And it describes our universe. So this is just sort of the formal thing. Uh, if we take the antiderivative, so with this integration little thing, um, we've got this symbol here. We've got boundaries. We're going from point A to point B, so we're, we're closing it. Uh, closed interval. When we integrate that, what we're getting is that we take the, uh, we take the upper limit, the, the, the antiderivative's value at the upper limit, subtract antiderivatives function value at the lower limit, and that gives us the area under the curve. Okay. And again, it's so important, we'll take a whole nother section just to kind of say, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's really nothing much new. It's a, this technique's the same thing, they just felt that they need to spend more time proving it. And again, what you see is if you 
integrate it, and then you take its derivative, you get back to where you started with. Right? So we're going back and forth. In fact, I, I emphasized it again. Uh, if we integrate and we get this function, this is our antiderivative. So if we take its derivative, we get back to where we started. Okay, so that's just that's what's going on. So again, we spent this time working up to it. Nothing really new. We'll look at some examples such as this one. Okay. So now, instead of trying to think of Riemann sums and left left boundaries and right boundaries and all that kind of stuff that we did, we did that just to show that that's one way to get the area under the curve if we took that, those sums. Uh, but now, we just need to find the antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of x squared? x to the third, right, because we're going to add 1 to the exponent, and then we have to divide by that new exponent. Okay, so it's kind of, that's it. We would, before we would put plus a constant, right, we don't have to in this case, and again, if Sometimes it just doesn't feel quite like 100%. Take its derivative and see you get back to what you started from. Go back and forth, back and forth, back and you'll see. Yeah, that's it. And then what we do is, okay, to get the area under the curve, I'm just going to plug in 0, and I'm going to plug in 1, and I'm going to subtract them. The upper boundary goes first. So I put in 1 squared over 3, and then I'm going to subtract 0 squared over 3. And that looks like we get one third, right? This part's zero. One squared is one, so we end up with just one third. How could we check that? Um, let's see if this thing is working today. So um, we could actually graph that, right? So clear x squared. Now remember, x squared is a derivative of something else. It's the derivative of x cubed to the third. So it's, it's a rate is what we have. Um, but we, to use your calculator to find the integral, we actually just we put the original function in there. And then the TI-84 has a nice little tool if we, um, if we graph it. Let's, uh, let me just do a zoom standard so we can see the graph. It comes down, it goes up. And we've got a little tool. If we go second calc, it'll actually take its integral, number seven. So I'll hit number seven. And they want the lower bound is zero. That's the only thing, it's kind of weird. You put the lower bound in first and then the upper bound, but it's different than how we actually do it. And then it shows you, you can't quite see it, but there's a little bit of area there, and it's 0.33333, which is a decimal representation of one third. Okay, so if you wanted to, you might uh, zoom in a little bit so you. Maybe that's better. So you'll get used to doing this. This is a good way to check it. And again, you might want to check it first, that's fine. But, uh, you know, some of the homework, you could get it all done. It's just asking what's the area under the curve. You could do it all this way. But there's going to give you some that are indefinite integrals where we do have to integrate. I don't mind you doing it this way. Just do it both, you know, do it both ways just so you get the practice is really the best. Okay. Uh, but also, even though you get the other one, you got the answer, I think when I do this, it, to me, it feels a little bit more certain because I can see what's, okay, yeah, x squared is a parabola. Yeah, that's the area under the curve from 0 to 1. Okay, now it's making sense. My calculator says it is. This says it is. Okay, now I'm building up some confidence in what's happening. Let's see, where are we? There we go. Um, another one, and again, some of these get kind of this one's actually so easy, it doesn't seem right, right? If we integrate e to the x, what do we get? e to the x. It's its own derivative, so it's also its own integral, 
So that's where it's kind of like, really? Is that? But it is, it is. And, and that's where, when we look at the graph of it, it starts to make maybe a little bit of sense. So what do we get? E to the x, we integrate it, we get E to the x. That's actually a new function. It's the same function, but a new one. And we're gonna go from one to three. Now these ones sometimes, in, if they had it in like WebWorks, they might want the exact answer. So doing it on the calculator might not necessarily be helpful, but what do we get? Well, we plug in the three, so this is e to the third minus e to the one. And if we want an exact answer, that's it, right? That's it. Now, if we want to get an approximate answer, we could plug it in our calculator, get a decimal equivalent, and then we could also check it with the TI-84 and, and see that it is actually also the area under the curve. So it's just this e to the x, you start saying that that really is a special function. The slope of that function, right, the derivative, the slope of the function is the same as the function values. So if you get the slope at, at one, that function value is also the, or the slope of that, the tangent line is also the function value at one. And if I go from two points and plug those in and subtract, I'm actually also getting the area under that curve. It's just, it's, it's uh, makes you believe that our world is actually ordered and makes sense, you know, at least physically. That there's some physical things that happen, some laws. And then you study, what is it, the other kind of physics, uh, quantum physics. And it breaks all the rules, and then you say, okay, maybe it doesn't make sense. So, and we have that in math too, we have chaos theory, we have other types of things that, yeah, certain things work in the light of day, turn off the lights, and now things don't work the same way, so kind of like that. So quantum, so just as soon as you start ready to accept everything, it's, it's like it does work, but maybe not. So here's a table, this comes from the book, and it's, it should be very similar to the antiderivatives this we had, right? Because that's all we're doing here, is just saying if you've got, uh, say, this one down here, well, that looks like the derivative of the inverse tangent, and yeah, so it integrates to be the inverse tangent. So it's kind of just remembering your, what your derivatives are. So looking at them and, and realizing that we've been going uh, from inverse tangent, we sort of memorized it this way, so now we're coming back the other way. And a lot of the times when we're integrating, we just, we're doing it because uh, we've memorized it to a certain extent. Or if we haven't memorized it, that's why it doesn't feel, you know, like that. But it's the same thing with multiplication and division. I don't know, I still, when I'm doing division, I think of the multipl what multiplication. Three times four is 12, so 12 divided by four, it must be three. So you're, you're pulling back those multiplication tables that you memorized. You never probably memorized a division table, but you use the multiplication table to kind of get to the, that. And that's basically what's going on here. Uh, so, you know, some of these ones that are kind of strange that we had to just sort of memorize and we went through and sort of geometrically showed that that's what those were. Uh, you know, inverse sine, we're going to have something like this. So, going backwards is a little strange. And there's some that are going to kind of, wait, I don't even know if I can integrate this. Because not everything could be integrated readily, actually. Uh, but there's a lot of things that can be. So we're going to look at a few more examples. And just like this one, 1 over x, if we integrate it, we're going to get the natural log of x. So is it like integration of sine x with minus cosine? Right. Uh, so if we integrate sine, because if we take the derivative of cosine, we're going to get minus sine. So since we have positive sine. In the middle, bottom. Which one? Which one? Oh, this one, how? Uh, that's a hyperbolic sign. We don't use them, so, so yeah. The book does talk about these, but we don't. So these are hyperbolic signs and hyperbolic cosines. Uh, cos h, yeah, so these, we didn't do them. They're kind of, I don't know what you use them for because I've never done them either. So it's always a section we get a skip. So um, I guess if you were de developing something that needed a hyperbolic cosine or sine, then you would study about it. I've never needed it, so I don't really even know what it is, just to be honest. I could figure it out, but 
I'm not interested, so that's why I don't. <laughs> now, if you paid me to go, say, find out about a hyperbolic cosine of sine, maybe I'd do it. <laughs> and I needed to teach it, I would find out, but I don't. Not even in Calc 2, you don't, I have, they don't do hyperbolic sines or cosines. Okay? So this is kind of the list you might want to have on a little table sitting next to you as you do these, because then it might help you spot, oh, yeah, that one comes to this. So let's just kind of do a few of this one. Anyone have a suggestion of what we should do first? Before we do the calculus, we should do the algebra. Distribute. Yeah, I got stuck on this for a bit. I go, how can you do this? I look this, oh yeah. Just distribute it out. So we can't really directly integrate this, but what we can do is we can distribute this. So x to the fifth, remember this is uh, x to the one-half power, and this is really x to the one-fifth power. So if you take, when you multiply x in, uh, as a base, remember you add the exponents, is that right? Or do you multiply the exponents? You add the exponents, right? Yeah, right. So five plus one-half, looks like it'll give us x to the five and a half, but we don't like mixed numbers, so how about uh, 11 halves, right? Five plus one half, get a common denominator. So that's multiply both sides by two, so that becomes 10. 10 plus one, 11 over two. Okay, um, this one, one fifth, so we're gonna take five plus one fifth, Again, get a common denominator, have to multiply this by 5, so we're going to get 25 in the top here, 25 plus 1 is 26 fifths, is what that should become, which seems kind of strange, and I didn't work this out because I was, when I first saw this, I said, oh, you just multiply that and that's going to become 1, then I go, I didn't think it through, and now that I've thought it through, it's, right? because we're taking x to the fifth times this, we add exponents, okay? And that's our dx, and then we're going integrate from zero to five. Now they're usable, right? What do we do to integrate? Add one to the exponent, right? And my suggestion as we go through these, let me do it in a different color, is as I add one, what I'm gonna add to this first one is two over two because that's a way of writing one. We've got a common denominator. So that's going to be 13 halves for x, but then remember to divide by that new exponent, 13 halves. And we're going to flip it and do what we need to do with it. Uh, for the second one, we're gonna add one, which is five over five, again, because we want a common denominator. 26 plus 5 is 31. So then we end up with, uh, it's plus, yeah. x to the 31 over 5. Again, divided by 31 fifths. And then we integrate from 0 to 5. We can clean these up a little bit. Take this 13 fifths, take its reciprocal. So this is really 2 x to the 13 halves over 13. And then you're gonna get plus the reciprocal of this, you're gonna get five x to the 31 fifths over 31. And again, you could take their derivative and see that you got back to where you started. Um, and then we go from zero to five. Now the cool part of this one, if we plug in zero, what do we get? You get zero plus zero, right? They're gone. So that, a lot of times, that's why we like having zero as our baseline thing. So really, we just end up putting in five, and that function value is the area under the curve. Um, so it's two to the fifth, raised to the 13 halves, all over 13, plus five, times five raised to the 31 fifths 
over 31. And again, it's just, now it's just um, arithmetic, right? So you could do that part and just make sure you get order of operations and everything. Um, again, watch what the answers are. Sometimes they want an exact answer. Notice this is involving square roots and fifth roots, so we may get some non-repeating decimals and such. So if they want an exact answer, we would probably just put this one in. Okay. Or again, with WebWorks, a lot of times you just put that in and it will count it right. If you don't, then it wants like five decimal places, and if you only put four, it counts it wrong or something. Uh, but Okay, and again, you might want to get the decimal equivalent so that you could check it with your calculator. Just, and again, when we check the calculator, what we do is we put the original, we could go all the way back to here, put this in, and then find, integrate it, have it give us the value, and see. Okay, then that way we might find, oh, maybe I made an error here, right? Because once we start doing something, we could make a, a slight error somewhere along the line, and we're going to be off. So it's kind of... Uh, with these, just make sure you're, you've kind of got your work going so that you can see where you made an error. I generally will find my errors when I do it mentally because by the time I go to write it down, I might have had it right in my mind, but for some reason my hand writes things down differently. I go, dang, I said five, but it wrote six. What is going on here? So, okay. Something like this, I'm just, and again, I'm just throwing some out here. Uh, be able to, we might have multiple things that we're integrating. So be able to integrate e to the x, right? And the cool part of e to the x, it's the easiest thing to integrate. But it, that's what sort of makes it hard because it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. But by e to the x, it's integrate as by e to the x. Okay, uh, watch for sort of chain rule stuff if there was a five up here or something, anyway. And then sine x, remember we have to think that's the derivative of cosine, but if I take the derivative of cosine, it would be minus sine, and I've got a plus sine, so I'm gonna have to do this as four, negative four cosine x. And this is where you're kind of going back and forth between integrating and derivative to make sure you get your signs right. Because it's real easy to leave that as plus. Is that okay? And then again, what we do is we plug in 0 and 4 um, and subtract them, right? So this is our function. Just the overall, we're going to take the function value at 4, subtracting the function value at 0, and that's the area under the curve of the original function of, of, the, of the derivative function, right? Um, so again, we could plug these in, and so we get 5e e to the 4th minus 4 cosine to the 4th. Uh, and what we're sort of making an assumption here is that we're in, um, we're in radian mode, okay? Uh, so 4 degrees is much different than 4 radians. Uh, so unless they give us some units up here, this is 4 radians. So we would plug that in, and then we subtract. Here's one thing, because we've got two terms, right? We want to make sure we have a parentheses here. And then we're going to have 5e to the 0 minus 4 cosine to the 0. And, um, and again, if they want exact values, we'll, we'll leave it like that. So we get 5e to the 4th minus 4 cosine to the 4th. Again, if you plug that into a calculator, you get some kind of des decimal expansion, some approximation. Uh, we're going to subtract e to the 0 is 1. So this first term is just 1, so minus 1. And then negative and negative make a positive. Uh, this is going to be 4. Cosine of 0 is 1. So 4 times 1 is there. Oops, yeah. And we've got a plus. And so now we can simplify this part. Yes? Wouldn't be minus 5? Thank you. Yeah, e to the 0 is 1, but when you multiply it by 5, you get 5. Thank you. <laughs> See, I told you. You just got to be careful. Sometimes you just a little bit of, yeah. Well, little crow's new rules. <laughs> yeah, good. And so negative 5 plus 4, looks like we're going to have just a negative 1 hanging out here. 5e to the 4th minus 4 
cosine to the fourth. And again, if they want the decimal, we can plug that in the calculator, get that, or if they want the exact value, we just put that in. Okay. We doing okay? Okay. So again, it just goes back to when we were talking about antiderivatives. We're just getting the antiderivative. The only new thing is, is we've gotten that the endpoints, if we plug in those boundaries, that that's actually giving us the area under the derivative curve. So remember, we've got two things going. We've got a derivative curve. We've got the antiderivative, where sort of what we used to start with, and then we get the derivative. Now we're just flipping it. And when we get this second thing, this antiderivative, if we take the boundaries and subtract them, we get the area under the derivative curve. Okay. Uh, so this is the other one. So this is, oh, that's the word I was looking for. So there's uh, a displacement. Displacement is the total uh, positive, and then you subtract out the negative. So it's really the area under the curve. So this is the one where we just sort of, when you're looking for displacement, overall displacement, um, you just integrate, and you take the two endpoints. If you want the dis total distance traveled, in this case, because we're using a velocity, if I travel backwards, that would be negative distance, right? That would get subtracted off. But again, if I go one mile this way and I come one mile this way, that's two miles. It's not zero. If I do it with the techniques I've got, I would end up with zero. So what we have to do is this one's a little tricky. We just have to we really look at the graph. We look at what parts are underneath the x-axis. And then all we do is we take its absolute value and add it together. Okay, so we look at sort of total accumulation, regardless of. So they want both. So finding displacement is going to be the area under the curve. Um, so we're going to integrate negative x squared minus x plus 12. And they're going to go from negative 7 to 6. Okay. And so we integrate. So x squared integrates into x cubed divided by 3, and it's still negative. x integrates, remember that's x to the first power. That's going to be minus x squared divided by 2. And when I integrate 12, I guess I should put a dx on here. I integrate 12, I'm going to get 12x. So that, that's one that's kind of remember that if you just got a constant when you integrate it, you get the variable. Um, and to find the displacement, I just do what we've been doing, because that's what we've been finding. We plug in negative 7, we plug in 6, and we subtract those two things. So we're going to get 6 to the third over 3 minus 6 squared over 2 plus 12 times 6 minus, and again I put these parentheses, um, negative, negative 7 cubed divided by 3 minus negative 7 squared divided by 2 plus 12 times negative 7. And then arithmetic from here, right? Actually, I wouldn't do this as arithmetic. I would probably plug that into my calculator, and I would get the function values. Okay. Um, what I want to do, though, is I want to focus. So this is what we've been doing. Uh, it's really just the area under this curve. We could get it. I want to talk about the distance traveled, because that's going to be different. What we need to do for the distance traveled is we need to break it up into the parts that are above the x-axis and the parts that are below the x-axis and integrate them separately. The ones that are below are going to give us a negative, so we subtract them because a negative times a negative is positive. So because we want to really add everything together. So um, here we go. I need to get to decimals. And our function was, again, 
This time we're graphing the original function, the one that's in the integration part, uh, not the integrated part, x, uh, what was it, x squared minus x plus 12. Plus 12. OK, thanks. And uh, let's come out a little bit. Uh, and notice we were going from negative 7 to positive 6. So negative 7 is about here. Right? So this is all going to be, this would all be negative stuff. Um, and then we're going to go to s positive 6, right? Um, so that's here. This also would be negative stuff. And then this stuff here will be positive stuff. So we've got, th we got three areas that we're going to find. And so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate from negative 7 until the 0 point where it crosses the x-axis, this place here, which is negative 4. Um, and whatever the function is. We're going to make this negative because when we integrate it, we're going to get a negative value. And so that negative makes it positive. Or if you want to just think it's going to be the absolute value, we add everything. However, you, you know, basically both ways work. OK. Uh, and then of the function, right, we're going to add the positive area, which is going to go from negative 4 to 3 because I've already done this, if you, you could, this factors, so you could do it that way. Um, or you could click here and say, yeah, it crosses at 3. f of x. And then we're going to subtract off this other negative part, which is going to go from 3 until 6. And we're subtracting it because it's negative area, so a negative and a negative make a positive. So this gives us a total sort of uh, the total distance traveled. Because remember, the, the original function we had is a velocity function. It's a speed function, how fast you're going. So this gives us total distance. Uh, the first one we would do is giving us the total displacement, its total area. So we'd have positive area, we'd have some some, the negative area would be subtracted, so it would be less, right? And it could be zero, right? You could go here and then come back and zero displacement overall, but you still traveled. So just watch the questions. There's only one of these in the whole homework. There's like 25 problems. Most of them, there, there shouldn't be too bad. It's just kind of find the integrate, integrate them, right? Um, some of them like these, they'll, they'll give us, but this is the, the last question. And you'll need to sort of graph it and break it up, positive areas, negative areas. And then just make sure that you're adding everything together. OK, does that make sense? So that's the distance. That's the difference between distance and displacement. We're not going to use it too much. But again, we just want you to know that, that that's there. Because again, you're engineers. You might need, in a certain situation, to not just think of the integral as always the area under the curve and that there's this negative area, sometimes we want to think of total accumulation. OK. And again, you could work that out. You will work that out <laughs> at some point uh, on the last question. It, and it's not too much different than this. It's, it's just a different function that they give you. Uh, I also wanted to just kind of set this one up. We're not going to work it out. But it's, this is another place where it's sort of similar if you've got a piecewise function, right? So we're integrating this function, which is a piecewise function, from negative pi to positive pi. So all we really do is we break it up into two integrals, or three integrals if there were three pieces. So we, and notice this one goes from negative pi. What happened? Oops, go back. Uh, Sorry about that. So we're going from negative pi to 0. So we're going to integrate negative pi to 0. And we use this part of the function plus the other part of the function, which goes from 0 to positive pi. And that's going to be 9 sine x dx. So kind of now we got two problems in one. But just 
wanted you to see that if we've got a piecewise function, it's, it's not too bad. We just break it up into its pieces. Is that OK? And this is actually, I took it right out of the homework. It's probably the same one you have. So at least you've got it set up. Now you can integrate it and get it. Um, there's going to be ones where they ask you for the indefinite integral, and that just means they aren't giving us any boundaries. And so with those, we just get the antiderivative. We really did these before, so I don't know if they wanted you to emphasize. And you'll see some of them have a plus C. There's one or two of them. They don't put the plus C there for you. So when you put your answer in, make sure you put a plus C, or else they, it'll mark it wrong. And you go, wait, I got it right. Oh, I forgot the plus C. Uh, because you get so used to them putting it in for you. Uh, there's a couple places, I think there was only two that I picked up on, maybe only one, where they don't put the plus C, you have to do that. Okay, so definite, indefinite integral just means we don't have boundaries, we're just getting the anti-derivative in general. Uh, definite integral means we have boundaries, it's a definite area, we can find it. And then what we'll do on Monday is, you know, we just do the same thing, we just show hey, there's this big fundamental theorem of calculus that says we can do what we've been doing. And then we're done with the course. Got a couple days to review. Um, and while I've got you here, it's those who are interested in doing the makeup on the mastery test, I was thinking we might not really need two days full for review and maybe doing the Friday as a makeup mastery test day next Friday. Um, if someone, you know, so because everyone should be able to make that, right? Um, if we need more review time, I'm open to maybe during finals week scheduling a time either online or um, in person for studies. Uh, we'll just kind of see how we go. But really, we've tested on everything up to here. We got two sections that we're adding, which is not too much more. So that's all the finals going to include is everything we've already done plus this. So. Um, Let's kind of play it by ear, but just let, you know, let me know what you need. We'll, we'll make it happen, okay? But my thinking is, is next Friday, um, Friday of next week, to do a mastery retake. For those who want to, those who are satisfied with their score, you got a free day. Question there? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So, and the mastery will be basically the same type of thing. It'll just be a bunch of functions. It won't be multiple choice. I'm just gonna ask you to take those derivatives. Um, so that it's not tricky, right? Because however, if you do it correctly, you'll get it. Whereas the other ones, you could do it correctly, but then that answer wasn't there. And some of the, oh, it's not there, so it's none of the above. Well, actually, it was just a different form. So we'll work it out that way. Same rules, get 18, you got 100%. Got 19, you got 100%. Okay. All right, have a great holiday. Stay safe and have fun. <laughs>